Welcome to our second live session today. I'm super excited to be here with Pam and Tanmoy. We'll let people get settled in. I see the numbers trickling up as people settle in. I hope you, um, those of you who were at the first session found it useful and interesting. I certainly did until I had to jump off. Um, uh, and I am really excited to move on to the, our second topic today, which is how to do 25 things in 24 hours. We are continually challenged by having to juggle so many different things. We are creating content. We are sending out posts. We are editing those posts, first of all, and we are researching them and writing them and, and recording them and doing all the production and the content, right? Then we're doing the distribution. We're finding new audiences. We're engaging with our existing audiences. Then we're thinking about how do we make money so we can put food on the table. We are generating new uh, revenue streams. We're writing uh, applications for grants. We are figuring out how to charge subscribers. We are figuring out how to find sponsors. We are creating events. We are doing so many different things as individual independent creators that we sometimes feel like there aren't enough hours in the day. I know other people also may feel like there aren't enough hours in the day, but creators who are in some cases also juggling a full-time position um, have a, a particular burden in terms of the, the reliance or the expectation that their audience has that there's uh, gonna be continual uh, content um, coming up. So um, I'm curious for the people in the, in the room um, right now, um, joining us for the second session here, what you're actually making. Let's start with that uh, uh, quick quick poll um, as you're joining us. Um, some of you were in that first session, some of you maybe just coming into the second session. Um, what are you actually making? Or maybe you're not making something yourself. Um, or maybe you're making something, but it's not on this list. So maybe you're writing a newsletter, a podcast, a niche site, a video channel. Um, let's hear what you're let's hear what you're you're doing as we get going here. And then I'm going to show you a, a little quick, quick, quick preview of the case studies um, that we're launching today because I'm so excited about them and you'll get to hear in those cases case studies from both Tanmoy and Pam um, who, who we're about to, to hear from today. So uh, okay I'll, I'll, I'll share the results of this poll with you now. A few people are still responding. Three, two, one. Okay so let's see what the um, responses tell us. A lot of you are building newsletters. Um, almost half are building newsletters or writing a newsletter. Um, a handful are doing a podcast, some are doing niche site, a couple doing a video channel, some are doing something else not on a list. If, if that's the case, please share in the chat. And by the way, just in the chat again, um, share what you're working on and, and share a link. So share the name and, and what the link is so people can check it out and um, and see see what you're up to. And, and a few of you are not building anything, but most of you are. So we're among builders, creators, and that's really exciting. So. Um, um, welcome to everyone who is here. I'm going to share something quickly as we begin, and um, it is these um, case studies. So this is the um, set of case studies that we have um, developed, and uh, Crystal and Umbreen get the credit for writing these. Um, Kirstie Ademary is the designer. Um, many of the creators who you're hearing from were featured. It's their insights that we're celebrating. Um, so we're really, really excited to show you those. Um, and they are also available in, in multiple formats. There's a um, PDF version. This is one of the PDFs, for example. Um, you can see the design. These are not boring, traditional texty things. These are um, really graphic and um, visual and beautiful, lots of stats. There are various tables and charts um, in them. They are covering all kinds of cool topics. Um, there are takeaways. There are um, resources that we include and um, lots and lots of lots of um, stuff that I think you'll you'll enjoy and benefit from if you're if you're making something. I also want to um, um, point you to the fact that they're online as well. So they're on um, medium so that if you want to um, to see the um, the medium posts and, and comment and share those, that's also something you can definitely do and and um, that um is all hosted um at our publications page so we'll drop the link in the chat um and you can download the pdfs you can read the medium posts you can read whatever you want however you want whenever you want completely for free and hopefully those will be helpful for you and whatever stage you're at in your journey or maybe you're helping some other people or coaching other people or teaching other people or collaborating with other people um, that's all there for you and all of these um medium posts are here and ready to go um, and we are super excited to have with us two of the people in the case studies. Um, Pam, who is here, Coffee Con Pam, is her podcast and her awesome Spotify page um, that you can see. Um, Tanmoy has 
Sanity by Tanmoy, and it's also a gorgeously designed, um, beautiful presence for, for his work online, which I highly encourage you to check both those things out. You'll see the links in the chat. And I want to turn the um, floor over to, to these two to tell us in, a, in a, just a quick 30 second capsule how, how you got to, to where you are. Um, give us a quick, quick micro background, and we're going to dive into your insights and wisdom as we go. So um, Pam, do you want to start us first? Give us a 30 second version of, of what you're up to and how you got here. Totally. Thank you for this. Thank you for the chance to chat today. I'm so excited. I'm Pam Covarrubias. I'm the host of Cafe Con Pam podcast. I started in 2016 because I wanted to hear the stories of the people like me. And back then I was traveling looking for stories and I couldn't find them. And so one of the things my mom says is when you find a problem that needs to be solved, it's your chance to solve it. And so I took it upon myself to share the people, the stories of my people. And I've been doing it ever since. And to this day, we're 280 something episodes in and counting. So I'm so excited. Fantastic. <laughs> that, that is a real accomplishment. 280 episodes means a lot of hours of time and effort and sweat. I don't know how many drops of sweat that adds up to, but it's a lot, a lot of, a lot of work. Um, Tanmoy, give us your, your 30 second micro summary. Yeah, um, just thrilled to be here um, and, and fanboying a lot. Um, um, I started building Sanity um, December of 2020, so it's going to be two years very soon. I've done about 100 editions. Uh, started it as a weekly newsletter on Substack after losing my job, where I was uh, building possibly the world's first full-time sanity slash mental health beat. Um, started it without any grand plans or strategy until Jeremy sort of conspired to put a lot of bright ideas in my head as part of the EJCP program. And then I uh, uh, sanity did, did surprisingly well on Substack as a paid health-related newsletter. It was the only non-Western title on that list um, and then on their leaderboard. And then I moved to Ghost, uh, which is fully open source. And that's where Sanity has been residing uh, for the past 18 months. Uh, right now, um, thanks to uh, uh, you know the recognition that the work has gotten, uh, I am actually uh, uh, in Oxford doing a fellowship at the Reuters Institute. Uh, just incredibly grateful for for everything that has happened in the past two years. I want to hear more about Oxford and what that's like for a creator and for you specifically, what secrets you've learned about the mysterious uh, Oxford um, a little bit later. Um, first, I want to give you both an opportunity to share one of your secrets, your, your bits of, of insight. You've, you've done you know, 280 plus uh, podcasts. Pam, as you mentioned, um, San, Tanma, you've done a tremendous amount of writing in all different formats. Um, and, and, and I want you to sh give, give us one, one kind of thing you've learned about this uh, idea of, of getting so much done, about getting all of these things done in a given day. What, what's what's one, of, one, one of the things that you've learned along the way? Pam, you want to kick us off? I'm going to say, make sure you rest in between. <laughs> because one thing that I have found is that when my mind is overwhelmed, when I'm not prioritizing my well-being, my mental health, I just can't think. And so the more spaciousness I bring into my brain, the better I can think to continue creating. And so it's almost like, you know, people here take breaks, but it's like, we glorify productivity so much, but when I have discovered, when I actually take time to rest, like right now, I'm not home my, in my usual home because I'm taking time off. And when I get back into my desk to create, I'm excited. My brain is clear. And so I would say rest. Yeah, you stole my idea. But um, uh, if I have to quickly improvise, I think... Um, one of the things that actually I started, you know, thinking about consciously only after Jeremy said that this uh, session was going to be titled 25 tasks in 24 hours is that I, I'd actually never really consciously thought of counting the number of things I do in a day. But I realized that when I was working a regular job um, and I would sort of drive to work, um, that little uh, boundary between work and home uh, almost allowed me to reset sort of my internal calculator. So it, it was like in the morning, I have to accomplish 10 things uh, at home before I can sit out to work. And then uh, the counter goes back to zero. And then when I sit at my desk with my cup of coffee, 
I restart it again from one. And then there are the, like these sticky notes on the, on the soft board. And I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 things to accomplish. But I guess ever since I started working uh, by myself, um, and of course, uh, there is a certain universality to this experience, thanks to the pandemic, I guess. Um, what I've realized is that it's incredibly difficult. It's actually impossible to number your tasks like that, because the fluidity between my tiny office and the rest of my house, where my four-year-old is uh, constantly drifting in and out of spaces, it makes, me, it makes it very, very difficult. So I've actually stopped uh, demarcating uh you know professional uh, tasks and personal tasks because it was like really screwing with my head um and so i feel like yeah and ever since i've done that i actually feel a lot more um uh, a, a lot better because earlier i was driving myself up the wall to you know take off a certain number of things from my professional to do list and now i feel like yeah I, I, it's impossible to do that so why even bother yeah, I love I love that that uh, willingness to accept the reality and the complexities of it. Um, I will share one one thought on this idea of uh, and and also plus one on the kids drifting into spaces. I feel like that's one procrastination that I definitely allow myself is when uh, one of my kids comes in and wants to play. That that feels like a, the right the right procrastination to to uh, to to embrace. Um, one thing that's been helpful just in terms of me, you know, since we got to this topic of uh, multiple so many things on a to-do list right is this notion in um, Oliver Berkman's book um, which is basically about uh, you know this topic of how do we do all that we want to do in our in our lives you know given that we have such a short amount of time right 4,000 weeks um, uh, is the uh, is the title of the, of the book and and uh, one of the things he talks about it's a good tactic is sometimes uh, I refer to it as a, the shelf of three it's so it's essentially three things right, that are on the top shelf of what we're going to focus on. We may have a list of 40, right? I typically have a 40 kind of this week, 40 items, right, to be done, but three are on that top shelf, and I can't move anything into the top shelf, right, until one of those three is off of that shelf, because that shelf only fits three things. And that kind of shelf of three notion has been useful to me to get me not from, from move me from thinking about 40 things and which of those 40 things to just, okay, just three things. And when one of one of those three things is done, then I can find one of the things from that other messy table of 37 other things that I can bring in. Okay, maybe now that's one of the top three. So for me, that's helped to reduce the sense that there are a hundred things or 25 things in 24 hours and make it more about three things. And that has been a little bit of a, of a, of a relief. Um, I, I want to, ask you both about something else that I think a lot of us find challenges with, which is this idea of the buffet of consumption that we have available to us, right? So as creators, we're creating, but we're also consuming in order to create, right? We have to consume things, we have to read things, listen to things, watch things. And there's never been more available to us than there is now, right? And I'm talking about Netflix. There's a never ending queue on Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu and whatever other services you're using, Apple TV Plus, whatever it is. Plus, podcasts, right? And Pam, you you add to that with your wonderful work, right? And you had a great episode recently on, on pricing. How do we price our, our stuff, right? For example. So, so there's so many different episodes we can listen to of all these different podcasts. And they're each, you know, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever they are. Then we have newsletters, right? We talked in the last panel about how many people, 30% of people subscribe to more than 10 newsletters. That was the poll result, including more than 10% who subscribe, I think, to 25 or more, if I'm not mistaken, on that data point. And that means that there's just a huge amount of stuff, right? A huge amount of stuff. And that's not just not accounting websites. It's not counting newspapers. It's not counting magazines. It's not counting, you know, whatever other things we're consuming, we're ingesting from a media perspective. Our media diets are like buffets that just never end. So, so the question is, what, what do you find? What do you find is, is something that works for you to not feel overwhelmed, number one, to not feel stressed about, you know, what am I not consuming that I could be? What else should I be consuming? Um, but also just to cope with that and to prioritize what you do want to consume. What, what are your, what are, what, what's one thought you each have on, on that? Tanwa, you want to want to start on how you think about that? Yeah, I'm hoping you're not expecting me to, uh, you know, uh, provide definitive clues because, yeah, I'm just as clueless as anybody else. But Two things. I think one, uh, in fact, because uh, you know, at Oxford, I have six months to complete to work on a research project, and I have to read all of these uh, research papers on top of everything that Jeremy just mentioned. And uh, in uh, week zero, orientation week, we were asked to read this book called Salsa Dancing into the Social Sciences. Um, 
And uh, yeah, it's specifically a chapter on speed reading. And yeah, we've, we've all heard about speed re reading, but reading that particular chapter, chapter seven, for those who are interested, uh, you can, I think there is a PDF circulating online. Um, but uh, what, that, what that helped me understand was how much time we actually waste in sort of just like reading reviews and deciding what we need to read and what we don't need to read. Instead of that, that book actually offers like really sort of practical tips on how to decide by just sort of glancing at a particular book and flip, flipping through the pages, whether the book is worth the investment of time or not. Uh, so have a look. The second thing actually, probably it has something to do with, because I live with a number of chronic uh, mental illnesses and uh, I, you know, on most days I don't really have 24 hours. I probably have like two and a half good hours uh, if I'm lucky. Um, and because I write a lot and I read a lot, I have, uh, I started experimenting with moving a lot of my media consumption to audio uh, and specifically audible. Uh, a lot of books that I had, uh, that I had, uh, that was just sort of stacking up on my shelf and I was I'd guiltily look at them once in a while and never get to reading them. And then I realized I was actually overwhelmed because I was just staring at text all day. And also, I, I don't know if this is, this will ring true with anybody else or not, but Sometimes when you are confronted with, you know, print material or, you know, text, there is a certain immediacy to it. And you feel like you have to read it right now. Otherwise, you're never going to get back to that tab again. And I realized that just by moving a lot of my consumption onto Audible, I was able to be a lot less sort of, uh, 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 I'm going to use this word self-referentially, manic about it. Um, and uh, when I would revisit a book that I downloaded two months ago and read it, I was surprised by just how fresh it still was. And it, it didn't feel like I was late to something. So I think just moving and sort of adjusting to my own auditory sort of limitations and recognizing that, you know, maybe uh, this was not working for me because my brain just can't take so much, you know, text information. That's been quite uh, life changing for me. Yeah. I'm nodding my head because I agree so much in all of it. To me, definitely for me, I, I have ADHD and high functioning anxiety. And so it's definitely how to, again, prioritize my well-being. And I also work a lot with my inner cycle. So as a woman, I'm a human who bleeds. And I have understood that out of the four weeks of the month, I have two weeks that I'm highly productive and two weeks that I'm not so much. And so I, instead of me trying to push through to, to be able to perform to the common male productivity standard, I have been able to work with in my own inner cycle and say, okay, these two weeks when I am highly productive, I'm very social. This is a week, for example, today landed on a perfect day because I want to talk to people. <laughs> I have the energy. And then that's when I schedule things to get done during this time. And when it's my weeks of rest, then I allow myself to do lesser type of work and 100% plus 15 on the audio and in reading. Somebody mentioned that they used the, the, the screen reader. I use that often for my ADHD because that helps me to have all the, all use my, all my senses. So I can listen to the book while I'm reading the book and I'm, I'm highlighting the book. And so I think it's about learning and understanding how you work best because the world tells you this is the standard form. However, we all have different needs and and different capacities based on time and all of it. And so that's my my thoughts. Thank you for raising that and, and particularly for, for raising a, a, a frame for it that we often don't think about or at least I may not think about, or some others may not think about, or at least may not talk about. So that's appreciated. And I see others appreciating that in the, in the chat as well. I think the cycles, as, as you describe them, affect us in various different ways, right? Whether it's a physical body body cycle or, or different mental cycles. Tanma, you alluded to this, right? There's certain hours of the day that you're able to really get a lot done and be at your best, like quote unquote, or be at your most productive. Again, that's a quote in quotes, because maybe, you know, we can define what our best is in different ways. But um, but that could be within a day, it could be within a week, it could be within a month. Month. I think it also is in, in terms of our lives, right? There, there might be a, a period in our life, we go through a plateau 
we are less stimulated by our work or by or our creativity doesn't seem to be there or we we're focusing on parenting rather than on you know uh, pr productive work or we're help focusing on helping other people in something they're going through or whatever there's different seasons and cycles so i think that's really valuable and uh and i think for a lot of us who are creators we are um, sometimes judging ourselves by our productivity, right? That's a measurement we use as a yardstick. How 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 good am I uh, is based on my numbers, my metrics, and my productivity. So like process metrics, how much am I producing? If I haven't produced a lot this weekend, I've wasted the time. Um, or if I have uh, not generated more views or subscribe subscriptions or downloads, then then other people are, are not seeing me as having as much value. And and so those are those are dangerous traps. I think for us, mental traps um, for us to fall into, and, and I appreciate you you pointing them out. Um, I want to um, to shift into talking about the the realities of a of a of a typical day for you both, and you know you, um, Pam, in one of the case studies, you're 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 um, quoted as talking about the number of different parts to the production process, right, and how there's so many different hours that are required for everything from you know. The research and the reporting and recording in your case and then editing and then sharing um and i wonder if you could just say a little bit about that so what, what a sort of a, a day of production when you are actually working let's just, let's assume we're focused on the part where you're actually able to work and are working and are focusing what, what does that look like to tell us give us a little bit of a window into that productive part of the the day for sure and i think it was sandra up there that shared kind of like a time study. And I always recommend a time study, which is where you, it's it's annoying. It's annoying to do because you literally log every hour of the day and what you do during each hour. When I did, and I do time studies every so many months just to see where my brain is because I have uncovered that I fiddle. Just my brain fiddles from time to time. And I just, and when I'm fiddling is because I'm too overstimulated. To, I, I think Tam made that point of like, when your brain is just overly stimulated, then that's when it's time to take a pause. And then I bring in the ultradian rhythms, which is, you know, the focus time on, on your brain. I have about a 60 minute focus time, and then I need a 20 minute slowdown. And so for me, my productivity, my, my production isn't based on days, but it's based on weeks for the other reasons that I've already mentioned. And so for me, for example, on Thursdays is when I record interviews. I only record interviews on Thursdays. And that's when I can allow myself that space to say, okay, I'm gonna talk to this person, I'm going to interview them. And then after I interview them, I'm going to record the intro and the outro for that episode. And then maybe I'm gonna do a solo episode that day because that's my recording day. So I can put my brain to that space of you only record today and then Mondays for example I do social media so I record videos I have social media meetings I kind of like plan out what my social media is going to be for that week and so I people talk about time blocking I day block <laughs> because that's what works for me because my brain needs those much longer breaks if I time and and also ADHD follows a dopamine and if I say, okay, from nine to 10, you're going to, you know, do a social media post. My brain could be like, no, you're not because that doesn't give you a joy at the moment. So go walk your dog. And <laughs> so then I lose that hour. And so time blocking didn't work for me. That's why I day block, because then I have, you name the 24 hours when you want to do it, as long as it gets done that day. <laughs> and that has really worked well for me. And it goes, I know this is not possible. I do want to acknowledge that some people that work in companies day blocking might not be doable. However, one thing that I, when I was in corporate, I wish somebody would have told me is that accommodations exist. And knowing and understanding how you work best, maybe having the conversation with whoever is your, your supervisor, maybe they could work with you on that and test it out. Yeah, that's an excellent point, and 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 I think even for people who are working in different environments, um, we, you know, you sometimes can choose a day based on whether you're working at home or or in an office, right, or in a co-working space or some other space, right. So if you're doing a creative day, maybe you actually go to a library or a co-working space or a cafe or wherever you find your productive time. And if you're day blocking as opposed to sort of hour blocking or, or half an hour blocking, right, you can actually sort of think about the space in which you're working, um, in in sort of more holistic ways to, to fit that. Um, Tom, do you want to share a little bit of, um, in your view? Um, yeah, first of all, I'm just like 
so many lights are going on going off in my head because spam's just incredible um <clears throat> I think one of the first things that I uh, that I learned when I started working by myself was that I have to change the definition of uh, definition of what a finished product looks like in my in my own head. Like, what is it that I'm working towards? Is it an article? Is it uh, a voice note I'm sending to my community um, or an illustration that I'm working on? I work on everything. I've learned a bit of coding for the site. I do all the design and all the illustrations. I write. I interview. Um, I do all the research and analysis. I do subscription management. Uh, all the uh, everything uh, from end to end. So I had to actually because I I worked my entire life in uh, conventional newsrooms. The finished product was usually an article or a podcast episode or what have you. But I had to actually unlearn that and I had to tell myself, all right, today um, maybe the finished output that I'm that I'm going after is just writing two paragraphs of a really difficult email, and that will have to be it. I don't. I, I can't expect myself to actually even complete writing that email. So the unit of productivity or the unit of whatever output in my head, I, I had to radically change that. And of course, I'm in a very privileged position because I can afford to do all of this. Um, I, I, I understand, like Pam said, a lot of people are not in that position. But, uh, you know, I feel that that is the one upside to all the financial sacrifices and all the other shit that comes your way when you're a solo creator. I think this is one upside and I'll happily take it. The other thing that <clears throat> that I sort of like made a conscious pact with myself was if I do five things today, at least two of them have to be revenue generating. Um, and this has been a really, really difficult lesson to learn because as a career journalist, sort of cringe at the idea of having to, you know, earn your own bread quite literally um you know writing all of those emails and sending sort of pitches or whatever it is or just you know doing invoicing uh for all the work that you've done and you are owed money for um but and again uh hat tip to the ejcp program um i i learned this the, the hard way that it's incredibly easy for a creator or a journalist to get sucked into this sort of like your own universe of like creativity and you feel very fulfilled and sustained because you've just written this kick-ass article or whatever. And then at the end of the month, you have nothing to show for it. Um, and the, the reality is that, you know, you've got to put bread on the table. So I try now very consciously that even if I have three good hours a day or two good hours a day or whatever, I try to get at least one or two revenue generating or something that actually leads to revenue or, you know, something that has a financial goal attached to it. And this has been very, very difficult because, you know, it's kind of frowned upon also in our culture, right? Um, so that's another thing. And finally, I think uh, in terms of organizing my days, what has been very liberating is, you know, when you start working on a newsletter, there is a ton of, you know, expert advice out there about what day is best, you know, what time is best. And I have readers in... Uh, I think 75 countries. Now it's impossible for me to optimize my newsletter for everyone. But apart from that, um, you know, there was so there was this general consensus. I did a bunch of reading, and then there was this general consensus that Thursdays and Tuesdays, apparently, for whatever reason, are, are great for newsletters. And so, um, as Pam said, it's not it's not as if my brain magically is happy with Tuesdays and Thursdays as the most productive days. So I worked very hard. I worked, drove myself up the wall trying to meet those sort of deadlines. And I, I would generally publish on a Tuesday. On certain weeks when I couldn't, I would push it to Thursday. But then I was just very exhausted doing this. And I was like, I want to see what happens if I send it on Friday at 4 p.m. instead of Tuesday or Thursday. And, the, and here's the magic, right, which almost no newsletter um, sort of SEO optimized article on newsletter building will tell you is that if you have a strong community, a loyal community of readers, it really, it, it matters squat what time you send the newsletter. And, you know, you are not, you're not in the traffic game anyway. You're not in the open rate and click rate game anyway. And your newsletter audience, if they're loyal and, you know, they're, they're attached to your, to your, uh, to your work, uh, they will make the space and, and the time. So that was like this huge uh, uh, moment of liber liberation when I was like, oh, this shit is, it's, it really doesn't matter whether I send it on Tuesday or Thursday. And somebody, one of our guest faculty members, I think said this to us, literally nobody is waiting Tuesday 4 p.m. for your email to hit their inbox. Literally nobody is waiting. So, so yeah.
Um, so many great insights there um, to to uh, to pick up on. I also I want to recognize several people have have uh, asked some Q and A questions, so I want to get to those. Um, but I just want to uh, uh, second a couple of points you made about the creative taste, tasty creativity trap, uh, as, as I like to think of it, where we want to spend all of our time creating because that's the fun part. We love that. We're good at it. We flow. We feel focused. We feel like that's our purpose, right? Our purpose isn't to do the revenue generating thing. Our purpose is to create the thing. So there's this temptation to keep doing that and doing that and doing that um, and not to do the, the technical or revenue related stuff that may be less appealing, but as you point out, Tanmoy, maybe it's helpful to have a rule of thumb like that, where you kind of require yourself to do that. Um, in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, we all sit around and create all day, and, and maybe we'll get to that nirvana someday. But for now, in the reality, we have to have that rule of thumb that you, you pointed out. So thank you for that. Um, so I want to get to a couple of questions here. One is uh, a couple of people actually are touching on tools. So maybe we, we can get to that a little bit. Um, because um, you both have a, a, a tool set of one kind or another, right? We all have to. Um, Pam, in the case study, you refer to Descript, for example, as one of the tools that you use. So maybe you could say a word about that and, and kind of other things that you found useful. The question specifically uh, from one of the participants or guests here, attendees, is, is about your, how you schedule things and how you organize notes is, uh, is something someone else is asking about, how you organize all the content that you're saving, URLs and, and reference materials. Um, so if you, if you could both speak to that a little bit, a little bit about your tool. Okay. Pam, you want to kick us off? Yeah, I am the queen of tools and maybe I overdo it. I could overdo it because I always think about, can I consolidate or can I automate? And I have the privilege to then ask the third question, which is, can I hire it? And so in the beginning though, it's, can I consolidate or can I automate? And so tools come in handy to help me do that because, because of my brain, I, if I get bored, I'm not going to do it. If it's not giving me that dopamine release, it's not going to happen. And so I rely a ton on tools and software to help me. So I use Notion as my project management task to-do list. And I do want to caution us and all of us into not making the to-do list a to-do list because I caught myself when I was starting in Notion because it's a whole monster of a tool. It's, it's awesome. And at the same time, it's a lot that I would spend so much time in my to-do list, categorizing it and giving it deadlines and just making it work. When in reality, I was spending hours in my to-do list, not getting the to-do list done. And so many times simple is better is a quick one list it out. So Notion, and that's where I manage the podcast. That's where I manage everything. And even I send a Notion page to my guests with all the assets to promote. So it's one tool that helps me do a ton in there. The script is a great tool. I, I'm kind of like bummed that I didn't discover it earlier. <laughs> so I only discovered it last year. And what it does is it is a transcription tool. And so I want to make sure that I do my work in the most um, supportive way to others. And when I do videos, I want to make sure that they have subtitles just to support people that maybe can't listen to the video. And so the script is a tool that allows me to do that. It allows us to also do it for social media. And so it's a great tool for, for transcription services. It's awesome. Um, other tools that help. I mean, those are my main tools. Notion is just the all-in-one platform that I really use. I tried Evernote. Evernote was too messy for my brain. I had to dig too much. Notion allows me to organize it in the way that I work best. I've tried all the project management tools. You name it, I've probably tried it from Basecamp to Asana, like, and anything between. <laughs> and Notion is the one that actually worked. So when it comes to tools, I would say test them out and then find the one that works for you because I'm not a big fan of a one size fits all because there really isn't one size. And so just test it out and see what works for you. Thanks for those tips. I'm, um, I'm a fan of Notion as well. And, and, and Descript is amazing. And they have a new version, a storyboard of Descript coming out, which is really exciting for those who are interested in streamlining your video editing process or audio editing process. Really cool. And it's collaborative with other people too. It's, it's really powerful and great. Um, Tanmoy, 
what about you? What are what are um, what are a couple of things that you've found useful either now or in the past? Um, yeah, I'm I'm very old fashioned actually. I've I I tools and I don't get along uh, very well, um, and it just gives me anxiety. Just you know trying to figure out uh, the workings of a tool that I know is very hyped and a lot of people are using it. I must get on it and it just makes me anxious. So for instance, here I have to compile footnotes for this research paper that I'm working on. And I was, uh, you know, uh, Zotero uh, is a tool for compiling footnotes that apparently researchers find very useful. And I swear I got nightmares. Like I just downloaded it and just navigating. And so I have Google Docs, the <laughs> number one, absolute savior and it doesn't get talked uh, talked about a bunch it's sort of become almost like uh, unfashionable to talk about google uh, products but google docs is incredible for me i do i live my life on google docs and i've also realized that when i use a tool it has to give me a sense of accomplishment it's not just about how efficient the tool is it has to make me feel not stupid um and so you know when i started designing and illustrating Canva just blew my mind because every day I felt like I am the best designer in the world, like incredibly easy to use, but, and also very affordable, that always helps. Uh, but every time I designed something on Canva, I felt like, yeah, this shit is pretty good. Like I'm, I can do this. And to me, that is very important. So for me, efficiency uh, is not as important as satisfaction. Uh, you know, I don't know how else to... Uh, communicate that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I think I think you know, oftentimes we think about tools as being these digital tools, right? And we've mentioned a bunch of them, and and Canva is is a great one, um, and and Notion and Descript and all, and Google Docs. Uh, all these are are great, but but uh, I think for some of us, we we sometimes also need the old fashioned ones, right? The 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 post its, the pieces of simple paper. I, I've had. Um, uh, uh, practice recently, um, which some people who've been in our program may, may remember, which is these uh, crazy eights. So I just take a piece of paper and I divide it into eight. And for whatever reason, having the, the plan or the, the ideas broken down into these little boxes, you know, that are physical and that I could just write in that little space um, and have each of those eight blocks be a section of something I'm working on, uh, you know, part of the, the piece or the eight editorial steps I need to take um, and something I'm working on, um, that physical thing I find helpful, especially when I'm getting sucked into the screen, right? So this periodically happens. I'm sure I'm probably not alone, like rabbit holes open up and I'm ready to dive into them. And, and if I can stop myself at that moment and like turn to a piece of paper, somehow that returns my, restores my focus a little bit, at least temporarily. So, so those old school tools can be, can be helpful too. Um, I want to turn to um, a couple of the questions, more questions in the Q and A, um, and that, that one, one reader is talking about, um, you know, focusing on one thing at a time. Um, can you address focusing on one project intensely until done, versus managing several and taking longer for each? Um, sometimes we have to, but sometimes we can choose. And how you think about that? What we, uh, either, either of you um, have thoughts you want to jump in? On that, do you, do you do one thing and finish it to, you know, or do you have multiple things going on and go back and forth to balance it out? What's your preference? What's your approach? How do you juggle? How do you, how do you handle that? Pam, you wanna, do you have a thought on that? Do you, do you focus on multiple episodes uh, typically? Or are you kind of finishing one and then moving on to the next or? Well, I have to focus on multiple episodes because I record, so the way that the podcast is, is scheduled, I record, let's say, two weeks ago, and that episode will come out until three weeks from now. And so I can't focus full on fully on that one episode that week because I'm gonna have to come back and things could change a lot from three weeks, like when we recorded to when the episode is gonna come out. So I don't do the intro to that episode until that Thursday week of episode release because I tend to give an update about me and what am I doing the week of the episode release to keep it kind of more, more timely. And so I guess when it comes to the episode planning, they are kind of like, they, they linger until they need to be taken care of. 
however, we do use that, we, we do use Notion to keep us on track and we do have a process on what needs to happen to make sure that one thing is fully completed. And what I will say is that because I follow the dopamine, I tend to have multiple things going on at once. However, having a checklist really helps me to come back to the thing. For example, an episode to say, okay, where are we in it? Is it recorded? Do we have an intro? Have we created social media assets? All of the things that involve having one completed thing. And then I can come back and, and see what is missing. So that could push through completion. When it comes to bigger projects, like if I'm launching a new program or if I want to just do something like an event, that one I do focus on it at once. And I keep the little things that I'm, you know, working through like the episodes and the newsletter and the social media post as they go. So, I mean, I'm going to bring it back to tools. And I also wanted to to do, I remembered that I do use a, a daily to-do list on paper. <laughs> so that also helps me stay on track. So I'm both analog and digital and it's whatever works. So I don't know. I don't know if I was clear on my answer, but I think it's either or. It depends. It really depends. That makes sense. Yeah. So sometimes there's not a clear, you know, always one or always the other for this kind of thing. Um, Tanway, what's your, what's your kind of preference when you can do things your own way? Do you like going back and forth between multiple things or do you prefer kind of finish one thing and move on to the next? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, it's, Kind of similar to what Pam said. Although I, I, I can I draw an analogy from something completely different uh, in life, which is cooking. Um, and I, I, I love cooking. And I've realized that um, uh, my cooking style can really annoy a lot of people because when I'm at it, I can't, I can't seem to be able to get on to the next task until I have cleaned up the mess that I've created. Um, you know, when I was just sort of like chopping an onion or peeling the gar peeling a garlic pot or whatever, I just cannot, I can't actually even turn on the gas and start heating the oil until I have cleaned up the mess that I've just created. And so this translates very well into my other work as well. Um, when I'm working and I know that I have just sort of like messed up a paragraph big time, um, no chance that I can move on and do something else until I have actually sort of perfected the heck out of it. And this is like really nasty. It's not something I recommend to anybody if you can talk your brain out of it. But um, but so as a result of this, I, I do work in very compartmentalized fashion. I think mostly I tend to finish one thing. Like I said earlier, the idea of what that finished thing looks like has changed over the years. But whatever it is in my head, whatever I've decided that finished thing should look like, until I have actually accomplished that, I just, I'm stuck. I can't move on. And uh, I really think that, you know, that, you know, there are all these debates about multitasking and doing one thing at a time and deep work and focus. And I admire, I admire people who can make sense of this conversation. I, I honestly cannot. And I, I am just an expert <laughs> on my brain and how my uh, body functions. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just this uh, stubborn habit that I have of cleaning up after myself and then moving on. Uh, to the next task. Thank you. You know, one of the things I really appreciate both about both of you, aside from the work that you do and your general insight and wisdom, is is this uh, self awareness that you have, and 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 it's combined with the candor to uh, speak about it openly. You know, I think we all, uh, many of us, face a lot of different kinds of challenges, and I give you both a tremendous amount of credit for not only being aware enough to acknowledge that you have certain tendencies or habits or patterns or cycles, as you mentioned earlier, Pam, but also to speak openly about it, right? In, in, in contexts where, you know, not everyone may be talking about those things or open about those things. You both, I think, push the envelope in terms of um, being being courageous. I think that is courage to, to talk about things that people are maybe a little bit shy about talking about. So I appreciate that. And you serve as a model for other people um, who, who may now open up and talk about things a little bit more openly. So thank you for, for, for doing that and being that way. Um, I'd love to hear from both of you about, you know, we're talking about productivity and how do you do 25 things in 24 hours. One thing I think is is interesting to me is how people begin and end that that 24 hour cycle, right? Or, you know, wake up to sleep cycle. So I'm curious if you, and, and I think people don't often talk enough about this um, because how we start and end our days, I think has a lot of impact on how we 
lead the rest of the day. Um, can you say a word about one, one or two things that you do as part of your kind of wake up and get going routine and, 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 uh, and, and, and then the shutdown kind of routine? It, obviously, no, no personal details needed, um, but whatever you feel comfortable share, sharing um, for, for, a, for a, a family audience um, about how you get going and then how you uh, close out the day to set the stage for the, all the other stuff we, we need to do. Pam, do, uh, do you want to? Do you mind sharing, uh, opening a little bit of that? Yeah. So my best day started yesterday. And every night, so I'll start, instead of starting with the morning routine, I'll start with the evening. Anytime I'm closing my computer, I look at my daily list. <laughs> and, the, and I designed this because this is what worked for me. So it has the hours of the day, and then it has an open space because this is where my to-do list is and so I'll show you one that's done so these are the things that I these are my meetings and these are things that I need to do and obviously this day I didn't get everything done I'm a highlighter however the reason why I added the, the side for the meetings is because I can see what times I have in between so if you look at this day for example I only had one hour to get anything done and so sometimes that allows me to prepare myself the night before what I do is I only work on what are my calls and meetings going to be the next day? So I look at them here. If I look at the calendar, it's too overwhelming. So I need to make it simple to 10 10 point, <laughs> like analog. So that night, before I close my computer, I plan my day and I look at it and say, okay, what time do I need to wake up? Do I have time to move my body in the morning? Am I going to move my body in the evening? Because maybe I have a call at 7 a.m. and I don't want to wake up earlier than 6 and so that allows me to prepare to a powerful morning. And then, I mean, for the evening, you know, I wash my face, make sure, I always make sure that my face is washed <laughs> because, you know, skincare. And it's a form of self-care that makes me feel that it brings me back into, into my body also because being on the computer, it's very head. And so going into, like getting back into the body that, brings me into a grounded place knowing what I'm going to do the next morning then I also do a quick brain dump of what is in my head right now that it's not going to let me go to bed so I do my thinking of my schedule and then I do a quick brain dump of like what do I think right now that I need to have done by tomorrow and then the next morning knowing what I need to do already I wake up with a plan and so for me what works best is to move my body in the morning because then I get it out of the way or what people call exercise or workout. I call it moving my body because it could be, I go for a walk or it could be, I do a bike ride, you know, whatever works. And so having planned my night, my day the night before really allows me to, to be really strong during the day. I can move my body or, um, you know, go straight into work, but always coffee in the morning. That's, and I make it very ritualistic to where when I make it, I set an intention to what this cup of coffee is going to help me do and accomplish. So I am already kind of like allowing my cup of coffee to help me get through the day. <laughs> and then I sit down and get to work. It's kind of like in a nutshell. Beautiful, really well-spoken. Thank you for explaining that. I like what Swati says, this is golden. Thank you for that. Um, Tanway, and then we'll, we'll just have a couple words to wrap up after that. Um, I'm I'm actually not going to even try bettering what Pam said. I have I have zero wake up and shut down rituals. I like to end my day with cooking on most days, but there is really no great insight that I can offer. But I would like to with Jeremy, if you if, if it's okay with you, there's a question uh, that Lucia has asked in the chat uh, about how uh, you choose your no, and I think that's a very powerful question. So uh, can I just get into that for thirty seconds? Yeah, okay. Uh, so you know. Um, uh, again, uh, I think uh, in the past 12 months has, you know, basically been a journey into how do I say no to stuff. And um, I follow uh, two rules, essentially. Now, um, one, if I feel that a demand or a request is exploitative in any way, and now you, de you define for yourself what exploitation looks and feels like for you. But this happens a lot with creators, with solo creators. You get pulled into collabs, you get pulled into all sorts of, you know, pro bono stuff. Um, and you've got to, you know, over a period of time, you learn 
uh, what feels exploitative. And, you know, I just, with I mean, I just say no to everything that comes my way that just feels like somebody is just trying to, you know, exploit my time and my energy, which is finite. And in terms of what I say yes to then, um, conversely, apart from, of course, businessy things and things that give me a, give me a high and everything, um, often I will say yes to things if I feel like if I don't speak to this person or if I don't do this, do this for this particular person, then they will not, they, they will be stuck. Like I will be able to fill in a very important piece of the puzzle in their life right now. And I do this by having like a couple of like sort of pre-conversations. I ask them, what is it that they're expecting from me? For instance, I get a lot of mentoring requests and I just take a call based on, okay, it, it seems like there is really nobody else right now who can do this for this person. And if I'm not, if I don't step up, then they will be stuck. And, you know, then I just, otherwise I just very liberally make referrals and recommendations. I've learned to seed space also because the area that I work in mental health, uh, there are a gazillion panels and talks happening every day. And I, earlier, I used to look at all of this as an opportunity for me to sort of share my ideas, et cetera. And now I'm like, please do your work and find somebody else. There are a lot of other good experts out there and you're just not working hard enough, just being lazy by you know, coming to the same experts all the time. So I think those are some of the hacks that I have, that I've learned. Thank you, Tanmoy. I, I love that notion of seeding space to others and, and um, has multiple benefits, right? You, you open up space for someone else who might not have had that opportunity to speak and you also give yourself, right? The space to do something else that you need to do or to care for yourself or to be of help as you described it in, in other ways. Um, and you, um, you also mentioned, you know, getting stuck or unstuck, and, and that's the subject of our next uh, session coming up in a few minutes. Um, is, is, so I hope people will join us. We'll be in a slightly different format, a meeting format, um, where we can see each other a little bit and chat for half an hour. It's a shorter session coming up at, at, in a few minutes. And then after that, um, uh, Umbreen, who wrote a couple of these case studies, is hosting a session on collaboration, which is a great topic. And um, Tanmoy and, and Pam had things to say in those cases. And, and uh, and that'll be a great conversation with a bunch of other creators um, coming up right after that that uh, the short um, session, which is next. Um, and then after that, we'll wrap up the day. So we're we're um, we're thinking about creators, talking about creation, and hearing from some amazing people, um, including these two of uh, two of you, Pam and Tamai. Thank you so much. I, I really just had such a great time talking with you. I hope it was useful for others here. Um, who are listening and, and watching, and um, I've le I've learned several different things or different ways of thinking about things from both of you. So so I really really appreciate that. And um, we we uh, we have um, we have one final poll, um, um, and um, I'm curious what people will say here. Um, uh, when it comes to managing all the stuff in your life, how do you feel? How do people feel here? Hopefully you feel a little bit better than you did before, but I think we all struggle and we all continue to struggle. Um, so we probably will all continue to struggle indefinitely um, as life goes on, but, but hopefully these two have brought a little bit of insight and wisdom to, uh, to, to everyone here um, today. So um, I'll, I'll share the results here. And we are um, looking at people who feel mostly organized or somewhat organized. That takes us to 70% of those two fit in one of those two buckets. Um, a fifth of the people struggle a lot with organization. Um, and only a handful of people are, are fully, fully organized. Um, so I think we're all on this journey together. And you have um, done a lot to, to help us um, by sharing your insight and giving us a window into how you see the world a little bit. Um, so thank you for that. And, uh, and thanks for everyone who's chimed in on the conversation and been here so far and join us for the next session in a few minutes. Meanwhile, take a, take a break and, and care for yourself, right? Get re-energize, refresh, and join us on the other side in the next session. Thanks, Pam and Tanmoy, and congrats on all the great work you do and, and the, all the help that you give to so many others. So. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye, everyone. <laughs> See you all in a few minutes.